uh, welcome everybody listening from all around the world, all around this beautiful blue-green planet we call Gaia. Welcome everybody here listening in Australia, this beautiful country of ours. Welcome to the Mystic Drop, where each week we try and journey down the road less traveled by, as the great Robert Frost once poetically put. I am your host, Roberto Roya. Joining me today is Karen Alexandra. Along with her husband, Steve Alexandra, Karen has been recording the crop circle phenomena for 27 years. Mystery is the key, her, model, her motto is. She is the co-author of Crop Circles, Signs, Wonders and Mysteries, which I have right here. Anyone that is into uh, crop circles, I highly recommend that, that book. And, uh, and a co-founder of the Temporary Temples website. It is an honor, pleasure to have Karen Alexander on. Thank you so much for joining me, Karen. Oh, my pleasure. Great pleasure. Yeah. Thank you so Lovely much. Happy to be here. And uh, yeah, so before we get started, we've got a uh, mystic drop incantation that I like to share with my guests. And it goes like this. So we are two cosmic spiritual beings sitting around the campfire, two drops of light from the great spirit. Truth is our path and wisdom is our teacher. We start with a salute. And now <laughs> let our magic flow. <laughs> yeah, I know it's morning time over there for you. Yeah, time for coffee. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah, it's kicking in the uh, late afternoon now, so vino time. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, um, first uh, I'd like to say I discovered you on this DVD, um, Approaching the Sacred, by uh, Michael Glickman. You were, uh, yeah. you were a host of uh, the symposium, of the Crop yeah. Circle sym Symposium that Michael Glickman was a, was a speaker in. Uh, but we'll get to his his legacy because I want to talk about his life, um, his legacy and, and his magic. But we'll get there a little bit later. Um, but firstly, how did how did you get into how did the crop circle phenomenon touch your life? Um, well, a long time ago now, it seems. Yeah. So um, it would be, I think, about 1990. Um, and I first saw the crop circles actually in one of the British newspapers. And um, there was a big centre spread in, in one of the, the, the papers over here. And I was, I was really struck dumb by them. I, I was just astonished at them. And here was something that shouldn't be here. You know, it, it's not something that you normally see. And yet, and yet... Um, there was something that I really recognized about them and I couldn't really put my finger on it. So it was like this sense of being totally astonished and yet, and not knowing what they were, but yet feeling that I really knew something about it. And, um, and it, I think I, I wrote um, some years later that it was like a million words on the end of your tongue that your mouth just couldn't form. And that's kind of how it, how it felt. So I just knew then that I just had to find out as much as I could about what was going on and, um, you know, and, and try and go and see one. Um, but just trying to, to, yeah, to find out as much as I could. So in those days, um, we were, the, the Crop Circle World was networked um, by a lot of smaller groups. So I managed to get in touch with um, people that um, were already researching this and kind of took it from there. I saw my first Crop Circle a year later um, which was actually in my in my hometown um, because I didn't always live. I live now in on the south coast in England, but I didn't always live here. I used to live in the Midlands. Um, and and then 1992, the year after that, I had four circles all within about a mile of my house, and um, and it was like somebody left their calling card. So and I don't I actually don't drive. Um, so I was they were all kind of in walking distance. So I could sort of go and spend some some time in them, and that that was it. Then it was I was kind of full on and um, was part of a, a sort of a local group. But I, I moved down to the south of England in the summer of um, 1995. But um, um, 
and now sort of travel up and, and down to Wiltshire all the time, as you can imagine. But there, there were circles all, and there are circles all over the UK and there, there are circles all over the world, in fact. So in 63 different countries now, I think they've been recorded. So although England sort of seems to be an epicenter for it, um, you know, it does happen, you know, all over the place. And of course, you never know. So from one year to another, you never quite know where they're going to be or where they're, where they're going to pop up. So there's sort of that, that element to it. But yeah, from, from the get go, I just felt a real connection um, to the to the subject and really felt that I needed to be to be a, a part of it. Yeah, it's like those, uh, the ones that popped up near your house, it's like they accommodated for you seeing that yeah. you don't drive yep. that's, that's really interesting and i know that yeah. there's a there's that magical aspect about this whole thing where people think a certain thing or or a, um, a design in their head or they draw it down and it and it comes up so that's really interesting yeah that's a huge part of it i mean that, that that's some kind of wonderful part about the subject is that there is this very um sort of open um connection to um, psyche or consciousness or spirit or whatever you however you would like to define it and that was apparent in the subject right from the beginning and it and it is kind of what separates it from maybe um, we were talking beforehand about the UAP um, subject the UFO subject and it's kind of um, how it's a little bit different to that um, and um, you know that that it kind of wears its heart on its sleeve and you know, and the human. Lie. No, it doesn't. And yeah. that that so that connection with 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 the spiritual, with consciousness, is is very sort of prevalent in the subject. So it, and it happens in synchronicity, as you were saying. You know, people would be driving by a field and say, "Oh, wouldn't that be a great place for a crop circle?" Only for there to be one the next time they sort of go by, and and you know, lots of other kind of riffs on a, on a theme. Yeah, so exactly. so yes, from from the very beginning, um, people were beginning to notice that there was a, a big connection between the subject itself and the people that were involved in it. Yeah, reading and listening to to Michael Glickman's work, he he talked a lot about meaning. Um, he, yes. he wasn't very interested in the the scientific part of the crop circles, and that's what I loved about his his way of presenting. Um, the crop circle phenomena to the world. I think it was so unique the way he did it. So beautiful. Yes. Um, so in terms of meaning, what does the crop circle uh, phenomena mean to you? It means so many, many different things. I, I think it's, um, it's, it's very multivalent. It has many, many different layers to it. So, and there are many different ways that you can look at it. So you can look at it as um you know, as a mystery, obviously, um, you cannot, you know, but in, in so many different ways. So say, for instance, you know, people say they're, they, they're symbolic, that they have a meaning. Some people say that they're not for people at all. They're, they're sort of like healing places or healing mandalas for the planet, which, you know, I, I think there's, that, that's absolutely true. Um, some people sort of think they're a communication from elsewhere. Some people think they, they may even be created by Gaia herself. So there, there are many, many, but actually I think they're all of those things. And I think to try and pin them down, to having just one meaning or just one purpose is actually a big mistake because I think they work on all those levels. I mean, the other thing that happens is that they happen, crop circles happen or are located at ancient sites very often, um, especially, especially in the UK, but actually all over the world as well. Um, so there is that connection to the past as well, you know, to our ancient ancestors and, and so on. That's just one connection. So, yes, I think they, they sort of, you know, grab our attention. They bring us into the sacred landscape um, and they get us thinking about all these different ways in which they, they operate. So, yeah, I think to try and pin them down to having just one purpose or meaning is a mistake. But, I mean, obviously, their meaning also comes through their geometry. So, and this was Michael's big um, thing with the crop circles. He was a real pioneer for looking at how do we derive meaning from um, form and number 
um, and the way in which the designs are put together. So, and he was, you know, he was an absolute genius at, at that sort of thing. You know, he, you know, I mean, he spent many, many years honing his skills, but he just had a way of um, looking at this subject, um, which, and I was very privileged to sort of see that firsthand. firsthand yeah. Um, yeah, and, um, you know, and to watch him sort of spend his summer drawing the circles and then he would, he would pin them up in his home. So they would sort of be on a, he'd do these black and white silhouettes he, he put them on the wall or sometimes around his fireplace and he would contemplate them during the winter and look at them not just as individual designs, but as a group of designs as well. He was, you know, um, very, very committed to, to the whole thing. It was his, his life, really. Yeah, yeah. For people that have never, I've, I was saying before to you that I've never had the, the honour of stepping into a crop circle and feeling that energy, for people that haven't uh, had that experience, especially with the real ones, not man-made ones. Um, what is the experience like? Um, it, well, it can be different. So in, in the sense that sometimes people go into a circle and can be deeply, deeply moved by them. And I've, I've seen it so many times, people walk in them and they will just burst into tears um, because the, the experience of being there is, you know, is very moving. And... And for some people, sometimes they'll walk in a circle and it, will, it can feel quite flat. And there are lots of different reasons why that might be the case. So, I mean, when you begin, again, when you begin to think about how crop circles are number and geometry, they, they have an architecture to them. So, um, so for lots of people, they will say it's like walking in a great cathedral or one of the big ancient temples that they kind of have that feel to them. And it's not surprising because the, the, the geometry of the crop circles comes from exactly the same design canon as many of the sort of big Gothic cathedrals or the ancient Egyptian temples. So they, they have that connection. And of course, you know, when you think about geometry and number as vibration or maybe sound even that you that is inaudible but that that you are sensitive to that becomes you know a a way of thinking about this that you can think of of geometry as frozen music but it still has the same effect on the psyche it's it's why we feel the way we do when we walk into these amazing buildings i mean it's it's exactly the same with the crop circles so you know, when you're listening to, you know, you're being deeply moved by a piece of music or whatever. It's it's exactly the same kind of feeling as that. And then on, on the top of that, everybody has their own personal vibration. You know, I mean, we're all part of the human race, but my personal vibration is what makes me different to you. And of course, when you're at, interacting with other vibratory fields, um, some of them will resonate with you and some of them won't. So, so sometimes people walk in and they feel dizzy or uncomfortable. And so that's a kind of dissonance, if you like. So there'll be, so you, sometimes you can walk in them, they'll, they'll make you feel great and, and you're, you know, really resonating with them sometimes not so much, but, you know, and that's individual because, you know, everybody has their own personal sort of vibration so it can be different for different people even in in the same place but even so there's something to be learned from both of those experiences yeah i love it like when i see you know uh, pictures or videos people just start like meditating in groups sitting and forming a circle or yeah. with each other yeah yeah and it Tapping seems the right thing to do so it's... it it absolutely feels like the right thing to do i i mean most people when they go in a circle will gravitate towards the center yeah. um, if there is one because not every crop circle has a center but they they tend to gravitate there and then it just feels right to just sit and be quiet and just to think about the experience um, to think about all those things that got you there in the first place and also what what does this mean to me yeah. you know how, how does it make me feel what does this mean to me so so yes, it kind of feels right, you know, to to come inside and to to sort of settle yourself and to be to open yourself up and to, you know, be open to the the experience of being there, as well as all the other things that people want to do. You know, they want to go around and explore and have a look. Um, you know, what does it look like inside and and all of those those kinds of things. But yes, I mean, you know, I listen to a lot of people who say that 
you know, they'll walk up the tractor line um, because in the UK, we don't spray our fields from the air like, right. like you do in, in Australia, that the country's just, the countryside is just not big enough for that. So actually the, the fields are sprayed with tractors. They have two big booms that come out either side, but they leave these sort of tram lines, tractor lines up and down the fields, which is what you'll see in all, all the pictures of the ones from, from the UK. So a lot of people say they're walking up the tractor line and they kind of just say, is it okay for me to come in? Oh, is, wow. you know, you know, so it's like it, an invitation. So, yeah, or you know, just to be respectful of the yeah. space. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. beautiful. Wow. I didn't know that. That's 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 very interesting. That's beautiful. And um when for me, when I, you know, you've got it on the you've got it on the uh front cover of your book, uh Milk Hill. When that first yeah. came out, what was uh, when I first saw it, I was completely blown away. I was just like, this is, as Michael said, this is other, you know? Yes. Uh, what yes. was what was your reaction when you um, when you first saw that? And who are you? Yeah, just, ex- well, exactly the same as yours, which, which was just to be absolutely awed by it. Yeah. Um, and it, you know, because it simply was huge. It was, you know, around about a thousand feet across. And I think in that photo on the, the front of the book there you can actually see that there's a um a, a white van sort of on in at the side of the field and that just kind of gives you some idea of the scale oh of it. yes yeah it's like right yeah on the, right on the top yeah there. exactly yeah and so that gives you the kind of scale and those the biggest circles in that particular crop circle were 70 feet in diameter um, and went down to just a couple of feet across and of course it wasn't there the day before so it it, it happened overnight um, and um, it, it was a horrible night as well. It had been raining really hard, so the weather was terrible. Um, but, but there it was first thing in the morning. And, yeah, everybody was astonished by it because, you know, it was huge. I mean, we've had big crop circles before, but perhaps not quite as big as that. Um, and, um, you know, you, when you were standing in it, you know, if you, were, you couldn't see the other side of it, it was so big. So, and I heard and some it was of the details. Four, and, it was only four hours of nighttime, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, because in the, in the UK in the summer, it doesn't really start to get dark until I don't, maybe, maybe 11 o'clock at night, something like that. And then, of course, by, by four o'clock, it's starting to get light. So maybe about five hours um and uh, so yeah there's not not a long time at all you know to to do so i think somebody worked out that you would have to create one circle every two minutes to get it done in in the time frame so yeah it it, it was everybody was just astonished and also by the details in, on the ground you know some of the swirling of the the wheat inside was just absolutely beautiful it was like a work of art so you know it was it was gorgeous on on a ground level as well as as from from the air and it was it was actually placed on one of the highest points in Wiltshire right on the top of a place called Milk Hill um and so yeah so one of the one of the highest points in in the county you could see for miles up there but just a really astonishing event yeah and just going back to that you know people meditating and and, and feeling in awe um, being something like this, not just the crop circle, but the beautiful countryside mm-hmm. uh, of Wiltshire as well. You know, not just that. Yeah. You've, got, uh, you've got the ancient uh, Stonehenge there as well. And to add on top of all this, it's... it's uh, there, there are so many ancient sites in, in, southern, in southern Britain. So Stonehenge is one of them. Yeah. Um, then there's Avebury, which is yeah. the biggest um, stone circle in Europe. So it's huge. Um, there's Silbury Hill, there's, there, are, there are many sort of covered round barrows that, you know, there are all kinds of things and they're in quite a small area. So this, this kind of part of, of England was very, very sacred to our, to our ancestors, very imp- important to them. Yeah. So through, through your own research, being in, in the crop circles, for your own personal opinion, if you had to put money on it, who would you say that is doing this this beautiful artistic groundwork? I, I actually I think Michael Glickman summed it up really well in in the sense that there is something other about them, um, you know that. And I I I don't kind of I try not to go any further than that because I think we don't we don't know enough, um, and um, that there is something really otherworldly about them. 
um, and um, you know, and they they speak this incredible language as well um, of number and geometry, which is a universal language. It doesn't matter where you are, when you are, who you are. It you know, geometry applies every all time everywhere because we're literally talking about ratios between um, and ratios between between numbers between quantities. But of course, you know, numbers don't just are not just quantities, they're also qualities as well, or they could be said to have personalities. So each of them means something. And that meaning kind of isn't um, it isn't just a traditional meaning. It's actually derived from the geometry of those numbers themselves and their the relationships that they have to one another. So for instance, here's just a for instance. So one of the things that we see a lot in the crop circles are fivefold geometry, sort of like pentagonal. So pentagrams, pentagons, um, five petal flowers, all of that. And five is, is the number of life because it's seen in all living things. So um, when you think about the human body, for instance, you know, we have a head, two arms, two legs. We have five fingers on each hand. We have five toes. Um, and you find that throughout the living world. We're also full of something called the Fibonacci um, sequence or the golden section. We find that a lot in the crop circles too. Um, so there is something there about living systems, um, about life itself, about you know the, the meaning of that and the way that it works um, with um, in conjunction with other other numbers. So so there there are sort of ways of kind of beginning. To, to read that. There was a, there's a great geometer called Keith Critchlow, who you've never read, you really should. Um, and he called geometry the art of the ever true. Um, and, and I think, again, I, I think this kind of all lends itself to this idea that what we're dealing with here is a universal language of some kind. Yeah, yeah that's a beautiful way to put it. Uh, going to uh, you know the legacy of, of your, I know he was a good friend of yours, uh, Michael mm. Blickman. He was a hero mm. of mine. I've watched that DVD that I that I showed before over, yeah, reckon, reckon twenty times. Just loved yeah. his energy. I loved his spirit, and and the message that he that he uh, that he left humanity. We lost Michael not long ago. Um, what? Uh, what personal messages, uh, stories, and uh, tributes would you like to share about Michael's life? He well, I mean, he I mean, obviously, he was a on a very personal level. He was a really good friend, and um, I mean, he and I would talk sometimes two or three times a day on the phone. <laughs> so he would always he he used to say that he was my phone pest, which of course he never was. <laughs> um, but he he had he had just as you say he had incredible spirit um he was a, you know he brought um a very fierce intellect to the subject um he his background was he was an architect for many years um and he worked in lots and lots of different areas he designed studios for island records um he worked with um the, the eames brothers um he did, you know and then in his latter years he taught at the university of southern california so um, he traveled all, all over the globe, but um, he was just, yeah, he just had this incredible spirit and he was great fun. Um, you know, he, you know, he would always make you laugh. Um, and, um, you know, he, he, yeah, he was just an incredible spirit. And, and of course, so he brought all of that to the crop, the crop circle subject. And of course you've, you've seen his lectures on the videos that you've been watching. So he was, he was an incredible lecturer as well, but but what he really brought to the crop circle subject was that knowledge of space, um, of how things were made and put together. And also this great, the great passion and great skill he had um, in noticing things. I, I remember once I got into trouble with him because um, at one of the conferences, I introduced him as a, a master geometer, right. um, which he, you know, which he was you know and and I he told me off for that he said I'm not I'm not a master geometer he said but what I am is a noticer of things and so that's um, that humble that humbleness about him as yeah well. yeah absolutely yeah and 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 it's absolutely true he was he could look at um a design or a crop circle and he would just see things that other people wouldn't yeah so he had this great gift um and um you know so he would 
you know, he would be able to sort of tease all the threads out of a, a circle. So, you know, we perhaps might be going back to the fivefold geometry, although we see all sorts of geometries in crop circles, but just for an, as, as an example. But he would, he would look at things like, um, how were the different parts of design put together? What were the relationships between the two? And what might we draw out from that in, in terms of meaning? Um, and so he was, you know, a great, he was also a great teacher, you know, he had a way of, you know, really speaking to the heart, you know, he, you, you could watch a video, but you could feel that he was speaking to you. That's how um, I felt every time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so he had this great connection with people. Um, my daughter adored him because she sort of kind of grew up around him uh, when she was quite young he would do magic tricks and you know and, and things like that you know to, to get his message across um, and he you know so his legacy was was in that he also looked for things like hidden geometries so you know again when you're looking at a crop circle you see their exoteric geometry so that's the bit that hits you in the face the first time that you see it you know so whether it's that pentagon pentagon or octagon or heptagram or whatever it was that you were looking at but then he would look for the hidden geometries so those geometries which would hold the the design together so perhaps he would look at the relationship between the center circle and then the containing circle of a formation and and he would find that there was perhaps a fourfold or fivefold or sixfold relationship and that would be the bit that you don't see so he definitely you know bought that aspect of looking at the geometry of the circles and again all the time he was looking for what is being communicated here what are we being told um and he was you know he you know he was a, a great advocate of um you know con taking crop circles seriously and seeing them as a you know a subject that was worthy of people's time and consideration because i think like a lot of um, particularly, I think, paranormal subjects, um, you know, people don't take to tend to take them very seriously. They're, they're very often ridiculed. Um, and, and But he was a great advocate for the subject. I think that's what I really miss about him, apart from our conversations. You know, when he'd call up and say, oh, Karen, I've been working on this eightfold. And then we get into this whole conversation about, about that. But it was his advocacy of the subject, you know, um, and he was a truly great um, advocate of, of the crop circles. And I miss that very, very much about him um, because he, he did have this way of being able to connect with people um, and, and be able to, to show them his passion about this subject, what it was about them that made him tick and get you enthusiastic about it, you know, um, and it's, it's very sad he's gone. Michael, I hope you're listening and yeah, yeah. we love you very much. This is for you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I dream about him quite a lot, actually, you know. Um, has he come to, um, I was going to say, has he come to, you know, spiritually visited you? Or? Yes, I think maybe once. Um, I was, um, I sat at my drawing desk behind me and I was, um, drawing up a circle one afternoon and um and I just I heard his voice sort of say my name just that was it but it was um yeah it was a very intense I you know it, it brought me to tears because um you know when I think when you miss somebody a lot you know just sort of any connection is very very precious so but yeah, you know, I sort of, I do dream about him a lot. I was giving a geometry workshop, crop circle geometry workshop, I think about a year ago now and thinking about how I was going to put it all together and, and then had this dream about him where I was kind of, you know, sort of, I was sat at a big table to, with all these papers and compasses that are trying to work it all out. And, and he, and he sort of kind of was in the dream sort of said, oh, you must teach the first principles first. And that was very Michael, you know, and he does, you know, I'm not saying that was from him. Maybe that was my internalized Michael speaking to me, but, you know, I'll, you know, I'll take that because, you know, A, it's very good advice um, and it's something he would have definitely said. So. Well, well they say yeah. that spirit talks to telepathically. So yeah. Yeah. I reckon yeah. it was him coming through, <laughs> helping yeah. you out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Even on the other yeah. side. What yeah. um what I loved about him, you know, apart from his deep wisdom that he had and 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 uh, deep heart and soul, 
he was so funny. He had this wittiness about him that just like watching that DVD over and over and over, I was just cracking myself up laughing at the, the, yeah. at his, especially the start of his presentations, you know? Yeah, um, no, he, he was incredibly funny man. And, yeah. um, you know, would have people in stitches, you know, yeah. all, you know, permanently, you know, because, um, and that, that, again, that was that, way he had of being able to communicate with people and being able to use humor or laughter you know so it brings down barriers straight away nice. yeah. um yeah. and um you know um and you have to be really good at it too you know yeah. um but yeah he was he was incredibly funny he actually he always he was he was so funny because what he used to like to do was he, you know he'd be sat having a very earnest conversation and if it, if he felt that it was getting too earnest he'd swear so, you know, he'd, he'd drop an S bomb or something. And, Just out of nowhere. You know, and if, yeah, out of nowhere. And so, you know, and of course people would be really shocked, you know, because yeah. they, they sort of didn't think that he would, you know, use language like that. Actually, he did all the time. But, he, you know, I just saw him do things like that. And again, it was about breaking down communication barriers. It yeah. was about, you know, don't hold this, you know, reverently and respectfully, but li also lightly. You know that um, you know, don't take yourself too seriously. Don't you know? Don't don't become so earnest that it it kind of just spoils the joy joy of it. And of course, you know that's the big thing about crop circles too is that it's a, a very joyous kind of subject to be involved in. You know, being out in the countryside, being excited about seeing something new, um, being connected with other people who are, are very like you too as well. It's it you know it it is a great there's a great sense of joy to it. So. You know, he absolutely sort of mirrored that as well, and by using by using humour, yeah. That's that's one of the things I loved about him. <laughs> yeah, absolutely brilliant. What do you think? Uh, one of his biggest hopes for the the crop circles uh, would be, you know, for the future. I think I I actually again, you know, Michael's interest in the subject was obviously quite specific and had focus but he was interested in many many other what what I would term transformative phenomena so whether yeah. it was the UFO subject or the paranormal subject or spirituality on a on a bigger he was, you know he had a you know a great love of spirituality and and um you know was was a spiritual person um very much so I I think he I think his greatest wish was was to meet the other whatever that is you know was that was he, I mean he again you know one of the ways that he would make you laugh was that he would always call the crop circle makers the girls um girls. and I never heard that in the, the video yeah, yeah yeah he would always call them the girls and the girls. because he because he very much picked up on the fact that that the sacred feminine was very much a big part of what was happening you know with the crop circles whether it was their connection to the earth or, you know, that the fact that they were planted in, um, made in, in wheat fields, which was about nourishing, germinating, all those things. And plus some of the, you know, the geometry, you know, that there's great use of the vesica Pisces, for instance, in, in the, the geometry of the circle. So all these things kind of connected to the, the sacred feminine. So, yes, he would call the, the circle makers the girls. But, you know, and again, that would make you laugh, but there was yeah. a, a, a seriousness behind it as well in what he was trying to communicate. I can just yeah. hear so, him saying, like, ah, the girls are at it again or something like yeah, that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so whenever now, we're, we, you know, I, I talk to somebody who knew him, you know, one of the things that they would say is, oh, yeah, he's probably with the girls now, you know. Oh, so, the girls, yeah. yeah, so, so, yeah, so, but yes, I think he, I think he always felt very, very deeply that there was some other form of intelligence involved with the crop circles um, and, you know, with all these other great subjects that he was also interested in. And I think it was his dearest hope that that one day he'd he'd get to to meet whatever that is. So, do think, yeah, do you think do you think that, you know, I'm, I'm very spiritual myself and, mm. uh, and I believe that, you know, we, we go home after this, mm. uh, this little journey that we're on. Do you yep. think that we do, like, out of all the, you know, the, the, the crop circles, the UFO phenomena, all the mysteries in life that we're so captivated by, do you think that we do go home and go, ah, that's it, you know, everything's explained <laughs> so easily? 
I don't I don't know. I, I think do we do we move on to something else when we die here? Yes, I think we do. I am I'm a great believer in that. I'm not quite sure what that is. Do, do I think we ever will know everything? No, because then what would be the point? I think I, I think the point of being aware is to learn constantly, you know, um, and and to to grow. I mean, you know, to grow and to perpetuate oneself and, and knowledge is is part of what being alive is um, and about, you know, what being self-aware is as well. So do I think we go to a place where all is known? Maybe not. But do we go to a place where maybe more is known? Yes, I think I think we do. Um, you know, we go on to to whatever is next. You know, perhaps there are other things to explore. I also think there are hints of that in in all these subjects, you know, you, even the sort of the um, not just in the crop circles, but in the UFO subject too. You know, there are there are crossovers. You know, very often people will say, um, "I I was a great fan of John Mack, for instance, and and actually got to meet the great man a few times. He came over and had a summer in the crop circles one year. Yeah, I saw him um, on, the, on yeah. the DVD. He was in the he was in yeah. the crowd. Yeah. Yeah, and he had, he spoke at the symposium one of those years, oh, wow, okay. um, and and got to spend a, a few days in and around the crop circles, which he he had a great time. So, um, but I think that um, you know that there are connections. So so many people who have had close encounters will often say that they have seen the dead or relatives or people that they knew that have passed on. Um, and, it, you know, it's the same, you know, with ghost phenomena or whatever you're dealing on that. Like even shamanic practices, you know, altered states of consciousness, people will talk about being in touch with their ancestors or the ancestors. Um, you know, very often people who, you know, journey, whether it's with ayahuasca or peyote or whatever it is, will say that they encounter people that that had passed over. So I do think there's a great connection between all of these things um and um you know and and that mystery of what happens to us and and where where we go on is is a big part of all of this i think in fact i was just reading recently you know about um um bob bigelow's um um competition that he had about oh, yes. getting people to write the best yeah. paper about you know do, is there life after death and do yeah. we yep yeah, do we continue and and again, you know, so I read some of the papers for that. And so much of that, you know, is it's interconnected. You know, there yes, are these yeah. like golden threads that go through all of these subjects. Um, and I think that the mystery of what happens to us when we die is is central to that. 100 yeah. percent. Yeah, I always say this, you know, every phenomena that we have, you know, the, 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 we're part of and is part of us. Um, it's one big puzzle that, you know, we, we've got put the pieces together until we yeah. see the picture if we if we see the picture but i think there's a real yeah. in the mystery of it as well there, and, there is and i i think that but i think that's kind of all part of it too in the sense that that's exactly what these subjects get you to do is to yeah. open your mind to expand your perspective um you know and again there's a lot of that in in the crop circles in the sense that that's what we're dealing with often when we look at the designs we're dealing with perspective we're dealing with relationships we're dealing with um you know the archetypal nature of 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 number and of reality because ultimately you know all of reality is built from you know these 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 um realms of, of vibrating energy or matter so um you know that there is all of these things are super super connected and and i think so it's important to have your focus you know which for me might be the crop circles but then it's also important to have an awareness of how that fits in the bigger picture um and i think maybe we don't do enough of that you know we we all get sort of into our specialisms um and you know that's needed but we also need to have sort of that sense of, of the big picture too, um, you know, and how how all this how all this connects and what we can learn about our own subject from looking at all the others too. You know, I mean, another thing, you know, another connection that just springs to mind right now is thinking about, you know, crop circles again. There's that um, focus on on the symbolic. So, um, you know, the idea that, that, that numbers and proportions and ratios are symbolic and they have inherent meaning. Um, you know, and I often wonder 
you know, I'm 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 very drawn to people like John Mack or maybe people like Jacques Vallée or um, one of the modern authors, Jeffrey Kripal, for instance, or somebody even like Patrick Harper, um, you know, who looked at uh, the symbolic nature of the of the paranormal. So not just to look at the nuts and bolts of things. That's important. Don't get me wrong. It is important. But to also think about these things symbolically, you know, I mean, in, in the UAP subject, for instance, you know, experiences will often talk about um, the idea that, um, you know, that 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 somehow there's there's a, a narrative to being an experiencer, um, you know, that it's to do with hybridization, that it's to do with um, um, well, lots of lots of different things, but I often wonder how we might look at that symbolically. For instance, you know, what if that what is being communicated here is symbolic rather than literal? And and I think one thing I've learned very very much from my long involvement in this subject is is not to take things too literally. You know that that um, you know that very often what is being communicated is symbolic because it's that sim you know to to think symbolically or to think of narrative in a dreamlike way it, it's a way of connecting directly with psyche so um, you know and and sim you know the idea of the symbol is the language of the psyche you know you you think back to people like Jung who was a, a huge pioneer and advocate of this so. You know, and the crop circles teach us to do that because so little is known about their physicality, you know, about how they're made exactly and 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 even to an extent who makes them. But there is this level of of, of them being symbolic and that that narrative is, is symbolic. So I think that's a, a thing that can be then transposed on other um, similar subjects and to not to look at them literally, but to say, OK, what? What symbolically is going on here? So what are, what are the, the archetypes, if you like? So, so for instance, you know, if you're thinking about the hybridization part of the experience of phenomenon, is, there, is, is that a literal thing? Well, possibly, possibly it is. But I also think there's a symbolic element to that as well about the idea of um, a, a, a relationship between species um, you know, um, and one that's not just an intellectual one, but one that is a is a is a one of of heart and great intimacy yeah. um, as well. So, I think actually, I think in some ways, you know, the crop circle world has quite a lot to offer as well. The other subjects in thinking about how do we interpret what it is that we're being shown or told, because we've had to do it for years in in this subject. We've had to find ways of doing it. Yeah. Uh, another mentor of mine, Bob Dean. Uh, I don't know if you mm. know Bob Dean. Yeah, you do. Yeah. Um, so he, on the same level as Michael Glickman, had that magic and, and, and wisdom about him that he yeah. brought. And I think symbolically, he, he, you know, I loved his messages about we've got, we've had this intimate relationship with these beings, not like, not just one certain beings, but like this universal family that, uh, that we're involved with. And uh, symbolically, I think that's that's a beautiful message. And I think, you know, we need we need to start opening up our minds and hearts and introducing these sort of conversations in schools and universities, because I think no, I, I do think no, I absolutely think you're right. I think you know, there's a there's kind of a you know a bit of a disagreement, isn't there? I think sometimes between some people who say who want to categorize all of this as very positive and some, some people who want to say, well, no, it's actually quite negative. And again, you know, one of the important things that the crop circles have taught me over the years is not to polarize because it's not helpful. Um, and, and actually, you know, again, to sort of look at the liminal realm where there, where there are crossovers um, because that's kind of where the wisdom comes from. Um, and, um, you know, so again, it's that, not to take things too literally but then not to go so far that you become ungrounded as well yeah, so exactly, that, that yeah. there's that meeting place in the middle somewhere so but yeah I mean I, I mean on the whole my experience of the crop circle subject is that it, it is extremely um, a good one it's a great experience it's a very positive 
a very positive one. Um, but seeing it in a family of phenomena, as, as we were, you know, we, we have been doing, you know, yes, there are some some parts of of you know perhaps the UAP subject, some parts of the paranormal that can be disturbing. I mean, the other thing I really love and the way I see the, the crop circles is as a form of initiation, you know, in, in the sense that, you know, particularly in Western cultures, I think we don't have that experience of being initiated as adults in our society, you know, that, that our initiation these days is that you turn 18, you go to the bar and you get bladder you know yeah, I mean that's yeah. how you become an adult in our yeah. in our society but actually I think the paranormal serves you know that uh, serves that kind of um, need in in the sense that you know becoming a, an adult is also about opening your mind you know it's it's about um, you know letting go of childish things and beginning to look at what it is to be a human being in in context of a, a greater reality and I, and I think crop circles and others, um, you know, experience it absolutely do that. You know, when I, I look at crop circles, the way, way that they appear in the field, that they are an open invitation for people to go and interact with whatever this is, um, you know, and they do, you know, so, and, and, you know, you've probably heard in one of Michael's talks, he would talk about something he used to call hospitality portals. Um, and this is the way that the geometry is organized in the field so that you are able to walk around the different elements. You don't have to break Nine. any, any crops yeah. to get there. It's all laid Absolutely. out for you to go on that yeah. journey. Yeah. So, so let's think about what does that tell you about what's going on? Yeah. A, it tells you that they have a, a complete um, respect for the medium that they're working in, you know, and, and not to do any more damage than is absolutely necessary. So, so making them accessible to people um, and, you know, and for people to, to walk in them and to come and take part in, in what's going on. Um, and, and also for the design to be, um, you know, done in such a way that, that people can do that without creating any more damage. So, but the initiation part of it, I think is huge, you know, and I, I very much see again, the sort of the, the UFO experience of thing on the same, on the same kind of level that it is an initiation. And the other thing about initiation is that if you don't get it the first time, it keeps coming back until you do get it. In different so, shades and different. In diff yeah, in, in different ways. So, yeah. you know, if you don't, if you don't get it through crop circles, you might get it through UAP or you might get it through, you know, spiritualism or meditation. Communities for that throughout throughout life, but you know, on a big scale, I think all of these so-called fringe subjects—that's what they are for. They're there to bring us on as as human beings to get us to think about a wider, greater, and deeper reality of which we are part, and which we are at the moment many many of us sort of hopelessly unaware. Um, and my, another great story of Michael that Michael would tell was he, he would talk about when he went into um, his first crop circle, which was back in 1990. It was this huge thing. It ended up on the, co the cover of a Led Zeppelin album. <laughs> and, um, but he said he walked in that field that day and he never got out. Be beautiful, and, yeah. and what he meant by that was that beautiful, that 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 his whole, in that instant, his whole world changed. And, and when he came out, the world was not the same. Um, and I, you know, and again, I think all of these subjects are, um, that's kind of one of their primary functions is to initiate you into that idea that there is something bigger, wider, deeper um, of which, which we are part. And that, that that's what being a human being is about is to push the boundaries constantly you know, is to find out new things about what it means to be human and maybe hopefully one day to have sort of a real open contact with, with something other than ourselves. I think it's coming. I think that's, there's, there's a reason why these are appearing and we're seeing UFOs and, you know, the spirit yeah. realm is, is opening up to us even more now. So I think yeah. they're, they're preparing us for, for uh, this contact that's coming. And I, and I think, you know, going back, that connection that crop circles have with ancient sites that we talked about right at the beginning, there, there is something about this that, it, that was known to our ancestors. You know, they, they knew about this, that 
I, you know, I mean, you, you talk to, um, you know, um, traditional peoples now and they, they're not faced by this at all. This has been, you know, this is part and parcel of their worldview and, and their paradigm. We, we've kind of come away from that, but now we're sort of going, moving back toward it. So it's a kind of a remembering as well, I think, going on here too. Um, I think whatever this is, it's been with us for a very, very long time. And it, it's us that have moved away. Perhaps we had to, you know, to grow as yeah. perhaps we've had to do that. But now I think it's important to, to sort of go back. And I, maybe one of the big discoveries will be that, you know, that they've actually been here a very, very long time. Yeah, yeah. What are, what are some of your uh, most mystical experiences you've had personally in your life? Oh, gosh. Um, actually, one of the most important ones to me was, um, I'll tell you two. Um, the first one happened when I was very much younger, and it was actually to do with the crop circles, because um, right back at the beginning, I was immediately caught up in this connection between this phenomena and the effect that it had on people's psyche. And so one of the things that I got involved was with getting a group, a small group of people together to see if consciousness could affect the phenomenon itself. And, um, and we, we took part in a series of um, meditations and also some field work as well. Um, and we, um, just to cut a very, very long story short, but we had done this particular We'd done lots of things, but one particular night we had been doing a meditation where we walked into a field and then it then blank. So what happens next? So that the whole point of the visualization was to to kind of use that super part of our imagination and our psyche to kind of dig into that. And afterwards, there were, there were seven of us in this group. We all sort of drew something that we had seen and we I collected them and I kept the pieces of paper. And a few weeks later, I got a phone call from one of my friends in the group who said that there'd been this huge crop circle um, very, very close to um, um, the area we were living in. And did I want to go and see it? And at first, I actually thought he was pulling my leg because we didn't we did get crop circles around that area, but not any of the big complicated ones. They were they were all down south. Um, and anyway, he was really persistent and I said, okay, well, I'll humor him. Then we'll go for a drive and we'll go and have a look, you know, but actually when we got there, there was this huge crop circle there. And we found out very, very quickly that the design had been made up of many of the elements that had been drawn during that group meditation. And also that this circle had, so there were seven of us in the group. There were seven major components to the design and that the crop circle had happened on the 7th of July so this is so that was just huge um and it and it what it did show me was that that whatever this was that that there was this somehow there was a connection between what was going on in in the the the, the hearts and minds of the group and what was going on in in the fields and then the second one actually happened quite recently in the last couple of, of years um and i had um I had a very, very strange encounter with a black cube, which sounds really odd, doesn't it? But, um, but yeah, one night in, in my bedroom. And, and I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that it, it was a physical black cube in my bedroom. I don't know. Maybe I was in a hypnagogic, hypnopompic state of mind, slightly altered state of consciousness. But I had this... Um, experience where I was laid down in bed and I was looking towards the end of the bed and I just saw there this appear this black cube which was maybe about two or three feet in diameter and I was I was actually I was utterly astonished I was actually quite frightened because it it was you know bedroom is an intimate place it's, yeah. it's a place where normally you feel very safe and I remember sitting bolt right up in bed and you know breathing quite heavily and then this cube just sort of rushed at me and kind of went into my chest. And, um, and again, I just, what do you make of an experience like that? How do you, mm. but again, I kind of took it as another initiation experience that there was something that I was ready to integrate at, at that point. 
um, and, you know, and kind of took it, you know, as a great gift, really, even though it was quite frightening at the time that it, it, it felt like a gift afterwards that, that I would, I'd been given something really special. Did you look up like the symbolism of, of a cube and, and all that after you experienced Yeah, yeah, because, yeah, because, you know, and again, you know, it's, it's interesting, isn't it, that how, whatever this was chose a geometric shape because it's something that I spend so much time yeah. working on myself. So a big part of what I do is, is, you know, like Michael would do is to draw the crop circles and to, and to look at their, their geometry. So, um, but yeah, I mean, the cube is, um, a, it's one of the first shapes that move into three dimensions. It was also the first shape that we saw um, in a crop circle in three dimensions. So that that's interesting too. Um, it's it's about foundation. It's a, it's about mother substance. Um, it's about it is about in some ways it's about the earthly realm. Um, so it's so it's counterpart might be the circle so the circle and square coming together is that marriage between the sp spirit and matter so for me the cube was about integrating something in the real world um, and and maybe to um, to look at, at at that whole process how do we look at what we learn through sacred geometry and through crop circles, how do we integrate that into ourselves and, and into the real world that will make a difference? So, um, so yeah, it was it. And actually not long after that, I then started to think about maybe I should teach drawing crop circles, you know, that that would be something I could do to give back and a way of kind of making concrete in the world, something that kind of seems, you know, kind of, out there and mystical, but actually when you draw them, you make them concrete, you make them real, you bring them out of the I ideal realm and in, into reality. So, so that was kind of one thing that I, I started to do after that experience was how can I kind of teach this to, to other people? How can I get them to have the experiences that I do when I look at these things? And um, how can I get, enable other people to have that experience too? Yeah. It's like the girls, you know, had a had a mission for you, and then they you know, <laughs> initiated you into that in, in that form. Well, so yeah, that, maybe maybe so, so. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But it, I mean, it's something that I do love to do. Yeah. Um, and you know, and has great import for me personally. But yeah, how can I share that and and get other people to 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 sort of reap the the same kind of benefits, really, too, and to bring this into you know in to be an important kind of meditative and spiritual practice as well. If you can talk to the girls directly, whoever they are, what would you like to say to them, you know, personally from you to them, if you could have them right there in front of you? I would, very, very simple, just talk to us more, <laughs> um, you know, because I'm, you know, I'm fascinated by the idea of, um, of, interacting with an other you know I mean we you know as a as the human race we kind of you know we have each other but we're very isolated you know or it, sometimes it feels like we are wouldn't it be great just to sit down with some some person else from somewhere else and to, to share stories you know uh, just and to listen to how they would see things differently and also see things the same I'm sure but to to have that conversation I'm I'm ready for that I I you know I'm ready for a conversation I yeah I would adore that you know I'm sure it would be incredibly challenging you know on so many levels you know um but but I would I'd love a go at that I, just to to listen to different somebody with a completely different perspective and um you know and to listen to their stories you know around a campfire wouldn't I mean that would just be so exquisite what an experience that would be yeah sometimes you know uh, you know I always say at the beginning of the show that we're sitting around the campfire and mm -hmm. I often ask guests you know what would you say to these these beings or whoever they are that are, you know, mm. they're in charge of these, these mysteries that are, you know, that are part of our lives. Mm. And, uh, mm. Yeah. I agree with you. It would be amazing just to, to sit around the campfire and listen to all their stories, whether it would be too much for our, our human mind. And maybe that's why they just give us little bits, little tiny bits here and there. Cause that's all we can. I think it would. Yeah. 
I think it would be incredibly challenging. You know, um, I mean, you again, you listen to people who have who describe contact with something else, and you know, very often that contact is telepathic. It's also it's visionary as well at the same time. So, yes, I would imagine it would be incredibly. But what a challenge! I mean, what what a challenge! You know, to to try to be able to find a way of having some kind of open contact. It it would be just, I think, the best. Really, I had a vision while while you were talking before uh, about Michael and him being with uh, with the crop circle makers and you know being with them uh, while making while making the crop circles and how it's done. <laughs> how beautiful would that be? I, yeah, I mean, I mean, that would be his, yeah, absolute dream, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> what messages of, I always like to end with hope uh, because I think it's such a beautiful, you know, uh, message and, and, and uh, vibration that we have as, as humans. Uh, <laughs> what messages of hope would you like to, to share with humanity, especially right now with everything going on? Yeah, it's, you know, these are tremendously challenging times for everybody on many, many different levels. They've been incredibly challenging for me. I'm sure they have been for you. I just, yeah, my my message is that there are, there is always opportunity to grow, to learn um, and to interact. And even though, you know, we're doing, I'm doing so much interacting in this kind of environment, I'm I feel fortunate that we're able to do this. You know, I mean, you know, we go back 20 years and had a pandemic. It would have been so much. It would have been terrible. Um, so and also that we, you know, that we can always find something to be grateful for. Um, that that's, you know, another thing is to always have gratitude for what 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 you have, no matter how little it, it might feel that there's always something to be grateful for. And um, yeah, that. Yeah, just that there is always an opportunity. There's always somebody to make a connection with um, and, um, you know, and to try to stay positive yeah, as hard as it is, um, you know, that it, that it is important that we do, you know, try to take opportunity and in adversity, I think. Um, and that, you know, there's so much going on in the world that's so interesting, you know, that, you know, whether it's the crop circles, whether it's what's going on with the UAP subject at the moment, you know, whether it's all the new stuff that they're they're discovering in the realm of consciousness and and looking at you know how maybe consciousness is the ground of everything rather than matter that's terrifically exciting idea um you know so i think yes to to kind of continually challenge yourself to to grow as a human being and and you know and to stay to stay as positive as you can I uh, hope keep shining your beautiful light. Dude. You just <laughs> such a speaking with you for the first time like this. I can I can really feel it. So thank you. Thank you for thank sharing. You. That. And you too, yeah. And you too as well. Yeah. Uh where where can people go and find you and support your work and, and buy your books and and uh, yeah. yeah, so yeah, we have a website. Um it's called temporarytemples.co.uk. That's that's where you'll find us. Um and um Yep. So we have a um, sections where we have an image library that goes back to 1994 um, of all the crop circles that we photographed. There are hundreds of them that you can go back and look at for free. Um, and and we encourage you to to just get creative with them to, you know, maybe to draw them, to contemplate them, to meditate on them, whatever it is that you, you know, you want to do with them. But to you know to use them in some way because they're gifts you know so let's let's take what we've been given and do something with them um and we 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 do an annual conference um that's been online for the last couple of years and sadly it probably will be again in 2022 because in international travel is still not in a good place um and uh, also um I, I work with a lovely apart from my lovely husband steve alexander who does all the beautiful photography I also work with a guy called Jeff Fitzpatrick, who's a geometer, and we do online courses where we um, really dive deeply into some of this stuff. So we we draw the we we draw the crop circles, we contemplate them, we discuss them, we look at them from all different kinds of angles, and then at the end of, of the the courses, we get people to say what it was that this crop circle means to them. So 
we do all kinds of st um, work like that too. And I, I write as often as I can on the website. Um, so each year has a section on the website and you can go in and have a look. Um, and, um, and I write them up, I draw them and I write them up for people so that they can go and have a look at that too and maybe try it for themselves. So yeah, we do, do an awful lot of, of stuff on there. So please do go and, and, and have a look at it. Beautiful. I'll put all the links down the bottom. Please, everyone, oh, go thank follow, you so much. Yep. follow Karen and, and Steve and the mm -hmm. awesome work they're doing because uh, it's just such a beautiful phenomenon. I think it's the most beautiful mm -hmm. phenomenon that we have here on Earth. It, it really is incredibly beautiful. Yeah. I mean, that, you know, again, you know, that what 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 is being conveyed here and what I think, you know, it is a, they are messages of great hope and great beauty um, and, um, you know, and something you know, I mean, certainly, you know, in the last couple of years when we've been, you know, living under, you know, pandemic rules and everything, they've been a great source of solace to me, you know, to, to know that, A, they were still happening, but, you know, also that it felt very, very positive that they were they were still happening and that something was still going on in the world. Not everything had come to a standstill. Yeah. Karen, thank you so much for, for joining me. I hope you come back again on, on the show. I'd love that. And uh, maybe get, maybe get Steve next time. We can we can do a three way conversation. I think that'll be beautiful. That'd be great around the campfire. And uh, and I know I know my heart and soul that that Michael's you know shining down and smiling upon you. <laughs> Let's hope so. <laughs> Let's hope he's not cross with me. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. I'm Roberto Roya from the Mystic Drop, and you've been listening to Karen Alexandra. Thank you so much, Karen. Thank you. Thank you.